we're making a D&D companion app with a tactile inventory system. There's backpacks, armor, coin pouches, and support for multiple characters. I'm Toby, lead programmer on this project. Come along and I'll show you how I made the grid inventory system. We're choosing to work in Flutter, a modern framework for developing cross-platform apps. Although the same kind of system could be built in many other ways, like Godot, Unity, or any number of JavaScript frameworks. Some of you will be asking, why not Pygame? Their logo is a snake too. Surely you can turn that into a hoop. And to you, I say, I think this speaks for itself. Let's kick things off with the items. Each item stores some data about itself, like name, weight, shape, and most importantly, image. There are hundreds of items in D&D, and Matt has been hard at work drawing them all. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Hang on, that's not my voice. What's going on here? Nor was that. Josh put together a giant CSV full of all the information that we need about D&D's items. Let's import it in and start messing around with some code. Let's start off with the scariest bit. This loads in the CSV, chops off the head, and then for each line it grabs the name, image, weight, and shape, and bundles them all in to an item object. We then add these items to a global list for use later, now consisting of all D&D's items. This function uses the item and shape classes, both simple data holders that just store their given properties in an easily accessible package. In the case of shape, every item is a rectangle for now, so they only need a width and a height. To actually display these items, here's a simple app screen with a nice old papery background image and a floating button. Every time I press the button, a new item appears, displayed by this self-updating widget. The process going on in the background is a little bit complicated, but it's worth getting to know, as it explains state in pretty much any application that you use. Behind the scenes, the app state class keeps track of the current item. This item can be accessed and set by functions in the front end of the app, but crucially, when it's set to a new item, the app state calls the notify listeners function, which tells any part of the app that's listening out for changes that it needs to update. This is what's going on in the build function. The selector listens to the app state's item and updates what it displays depending on what the new item is. If it's null, as it is at the start of the application, it displays an empty container, aka nothing. If it's a cool new item, it shows that item's image. The button decides which item is coming up next via the add random item function. It picks a random item from the list made earlier and tells the app state to update its current item. This then notifies the selector, updating the image shown. This slightly overcomplicated process of separated app state and visuals will help keep things neat once I add in more features. Speaking of, let's make the items draggable. This is way simpler in Flutter than it might be in most other frameworks. By wrapping the image in a draggable widget, I can now wiggle them around to my heart's content. The child is the same image from before, and it's what's displayed by default. The feedback tells it what to look like when picked up under the cursor, which could just be the same as the child, but can get a bit out of hand without a constrained width and height. The child when dragging is what's left behind in the child's place. In this case, our good old friend, nothing. Now we just need something to drag these items over. A slot, or in Flutter lingo, a drag target. This watches out for draggable items, and it has a bunch of functions that it can call when one is interacting with it. I'll come back to those in a little bit. In terms of its visuals, the drag target is just a simple container with a fixed size, a neat border, and a color. You might recognize this selector setup here that allows the front end to listen to changes in the slot color from the app state. I've added a slot to the app state in much the same way as the item is set up. The slot class itself is another basic data holder, like the item and shape classes. For now, it just holds a color. So whenever this color changes, the slot displayed to the user changes, all thanks to the app state's call to notify listeners. What actually causes these changes in the app? These little functions down here. Each one of them sets a new color for the slot. When an item is dragged over the slot, it calls the on will accept function. You can read this as on enter if you like. That's what it's often called in other frameworks. This sets the color of the slot to amber and returns true, meaning that the slot is interested in the item. When an item continues its movement to outside the slot, the on leave function is called, resetting the slot color to null. The on accept function is for when the user ends their drag over the slot. This updates the slot color to a nice gray tone, letting the item sit happily inside its new home. The drag target only interacts with items, so in order for all this to function, the draggable has to be updated to be an item type specifically. It then holds the item information as data, letting the drag target access the item's name, weight, etc. if it wants, which thankfully at this point, it doesn't. To finish it all off, the draggable and drag target are organized in a stack so that the item always appears above the slot. Now this is all great, but it's not a grid. 
This sort of simple single slot system does work very nicely for our armor page though. In order to make the transition to a grid, there's a few things that need to be done. We need a bunch of slots, all with their own color, laid out in a grid pattern, obviously. The item needs to know where on the grid it is, and it needs to be positioned correctly. The slots need to be able to talk to each other, changing in unison as an item is dragged over the grid. It's probably best to start with the app state. I'll swap out the item for an item instance and the single slot for a slot collection. The slot collection stores a list of slots and the width and height in slots of the overall grid. This allows us to index the slots, meaning in an 8x12 grid and counting from zero, every eighth slot is on a new line and that this item, for example, is positioned in the slot with index 10. This index is stored in the new item instance class. The item instance wraps around an item and adds the index to tell it where in the grid this item is positioned. It also has a copy with function that allows either the item or the index to be changed without affecting the other. I've changed the slot class to let slots also know if they have an item in them and use a similar copy with function here. It works in the exact same way, but don't worry, I'll get to an example shortly. On creation, the slot collection generates a bunch of empty slots up to the number required by the grid width and height. These functions can be called to edit the slots in the slot collection, either by setting the colors or adding or removing items. They all follow the same pattern, whereby get slot indices helps to work out which slots should be affected based on the item's position and shape. Then the slots associated with those indices are changed to reflect the new state. In add item to slots, the slots are given an item and the same gray color as before. In remove item from slots, they are reset to basic empty slots as they began and in set colors, they are given a new color depending on a color function that's passed. Here is the use of copy with, allowing the slot to change just its color while remembering which item it holds. Hopefully this is starting to come together and make a bit of sense as a functional grid inventory. Back in the app state, the slot collection functions each have a wrapper, allowing them to be called, then the listeners to be notified, keeping the app's visuals in line with the underlying state, as all things should be. I've also added a clear slots function that removes the current item from the slots if it exists, used to effectively reset the grid. Let's take a look at how this is all implemented in the front end. I've added a few variables at the start that allow easy access to the width and height in slots of the grid, 8x10 in this case, as well as the width and height in pixels of each slot. I don't know, 45 pixels? These are used throughout the build function, so it makes sense to calculate them at the start. Looking at the grid itself, I'm using a grid view builder to lay out as many slots as necessary with a fixed grid width defined by the slot collection. Ignore the word sliver, it's just there to be confusing. This builds each slot separately depending on its index in the slot collection. Each individual slot looks almost the same as it did before, except that this time they use their index to get their specific color. And I've updated the draggable interaction functions to use the item instance data that the draggable holds. So now they can ask questions about the draggable hovering over them and ask they shall. The functions are still fairly simple, with on will accept and on leave asking for the draggable item's shape and using the set slot colors function to paint the slots underneath it the same colors as before. On accept is admittedly a little bit more complicated. It's called when an item is dropped into a slot, so it first has to work out which slots the item would sit in, then it generates that new item, using the copy with function to only change the index and not the underlying item data. Then it can set the app state item to this new item instance and tell the slots that they had better accept this new item. Through the notify listeners function, this sets off a bunch of updates in build, changing slot colors and moving the draggable item to its new position. Speaking of, the draggable does require a few changes. Firstly, to wrap it inside a positioned widget, giving it an offset from the top and left of the screen equal to its X and Y positions multiplied by the slot width and height. Also known as put it where it wants to be, please. This means wherever it ends up on the grid, its top left point will coincide with the correct slot. I've also had to be more stringent with the image's width and height, making sure that it stays within the bounds of the grid slots that it covers. It keeps the same width and height when dragging, so that it doesn't jump around too much as before, and so it's easier for the user to line up the item to the grid. You might also notice two new function calls, on drag started and on draggable cancelled. On drag started is used to remove the item from the slots that it was in when it's picked up. This empties them out, letting the item drop back to where it was if it likes. On draggable cancelled is called when the drag ends outside of a drag target. 
In this case, the item is thrown away, never to be seen again. The final piece of the puzzle is the add random item function. This needs to be updated to position the new item in a specific slot in the grid. It does the same picking of a random item as before, but now it also picks a random X and Y position for that item. It ensures this position doesn't force the item off the edge of the grid by limiting it to the grid dimension minus the item's shape. A similar calculation is performed in the get slot indices function that I so gracefully glossed over before. Add random item then bundles the new item and index into a new item instance, clears the current slots of items, and adds the new item in. Now this is a grid inventory system. Absolutely nothing more needs to be added, right? Right? Okay, maybe one thing. When I pick up an item, the position of the item draggable doesn't always seem to line up with the position that it will be dropped. This is actually reasonably easy to fix. The problem is that the index pass to all the drag target interact functions is the one corresponding to the slot underneath the mouse. So this is treated as the top left index of the item, meaning unless you pick the item up by the top left, it doesn't look right. This is going to require a small change to the app state, namely another variable, the shape offset. I'll use this to keep track of where on the item it was picked up and offset the index past the drag target functions by these values. I've given it the same getter and setter as item instance, using the all-important notify listeners function once again. In the build method, I've wrapped the draggable child in a gesture detector. This lets us record the position of the mouse press used to pick it up. By dividing this by the slot width and height and converting it to an integer, we get the shape offset that we need. To make use of this value, I've edited the index past the drag target interact functions. Instead of passing the index of the slot that was interacted with, get offset index calculates which index the item's top left corner would interact with. It does this by reading the current shape offset, then calculating the x and y coordinate of the current index and subtracting the offset. If the item was overhanging the left or top of the grid, this might throw a bunch of nasty errors, so we can limit it to an x and y coordinate of zero, meaning the item doesn't go any further than it can, even if we really push it up there. We then convert these x and y coordinates back to a grid index and live happily ever after. Okay, fine, I'll add in support for multiple items. This is gonna be complicated though, you have been warned. I'm kidding, of course. It actually starts off with some simplifying of our app state. I've removed the item instance and the clear slots function and replaced them with the much more appealing add item function and his brother, remove item. You'll notice these call some new functions in slot collection. Let's have a look at them. Slot collection now has a list of item instances that it holds dear. The two new functions simply add a new item instance to the end of this list or remove a specific item instance from the list. This weird ellipsis format is used to make sure that the item instance list makes a copy of itself, meaning that the new version is a new list, so it's in a new position in the computer's memory, so the notified listeners function knows that this list has actually changed. Don't worry too much about that. Basically, it helps notify listeners to not be lazy. I've also snuck in a new function at the bottom here, check valid. This loops through all the slot indices it's given, and if any of them already have an item, it returns false, meaning they're not valid. Otherwise, it returns true, meaning they can happily accept a new item. Let's make use of these functions in the new build method. There's surprisingly little change here. The single item instance selector has been swapped out for one that grabs our new item instance list. Then, for each element of this list, we render the same positioned widget as before. Some of the formatting has changed to prevent these line lengths getting too long, and if I was a more elegant programmer, I might have extracted this widget out by this point. But ah oh well, that sort of thing is for when the app is functional, right? Something that has changed behind the scenes is the drag target interaction functions. On will accept and on accept now take into account whether an item is valid in its new position. They both calculate which slot indices the item is hovering over, then ask the slot collection if these are a valid set of indices. For on will accept, if they're valid, the same process as before is used, setting the slot colors to amber. If they're not valid, the slot colors reflect that using a red color. This is where the color function of set slot colors comes in, allowing it to turn an even darker red for slots that have an item in, showing the user which slots are making this invalid. It still returns true, regardless of whether it's valid, because the slot still wants to interact with the hovering item. In on accept, if the new position is valid, the currently held item is removed and the newly positioned item is added to the item instances list and to the slots. If it's invalid, the slot colors are reset, turning gray for slots with an item in and null for those without. The held item is then added back where it came from. On leave uses almost the exact same line from on accept, resetting the colors for all slots that the item was hovering over. 
Don't worry, there's just two more changes. The ondraggable cancel function is modified to call the remove item function, so the specific item instance being held is removed. Finally, add random item now takes into account whether the new item is positioned in a valid way. It does this with quite a silly brute force method, generating a new item instance as before. This is then tested for validity in the slots, and if it fails, a new position is generated. It tries this five times, then eventually gives up and tries a different item, assuming the current item is too big to fit in a gap. The problem comes from this looping forever, going through every item, possibly multiple times per item, until one is valid. If the grid is full, I don't know what this would do. Ah, that. Anyway, once an item it generates is valid, it adds it to the item instances list and to the slots, then returns to get out of the loop. There is one problem with this version of the app. When dragging an item over another item, that other item gets in the way and stops the held item from being able to interact with the grid. If the user lets go of the item here, it calls the ondraggable cancel function, which might not be what they expect. To fix this, I'm going to add in one tiny change. The ignore pointer widget allows the mouse to pass straight through our draggables, letting it interact with the grid below. With a quick addition to the app state, we can keep track of whether to flip ignore on. It gets the same getters and setters as before, and we can use those setters in the draggables functions. When a drag is started, we want to turn ignore to true. When a drag is cancelled or ended, we want to set it back to false, otherwise we couldn't pick up any new items. This is then neatly listened to in build, with another selector, flicking on and off when asked. Now, there are a few more things we could add, but I think this is quite enough for one video. We have a simple grid inventory system, and hopefully some idea about how we could build it again from scratch or extend it further. For more features like rotations, item notes, multiple containers, an item scroll, weight tracking, persistent storage, and multiple characters, keep an eye out for our app, Unencumbered. If you'd like to see more about how we made those, let me know in the comments and I'll happily make another video. Unencumbered will release in early June, and you'll be able to access it via our website at hoopsnakestudios.com. Subscribe here on YouTube to stay up to date. Thanks for watching.